everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Epidemiology Department's Candidate Seminar. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Brianna Moore, who is an Assistant Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Austin. Dr. Moore received her PhD in Environmental Health, specializing in epidemiology at Colorado State University and then completed her postdoctoral training with the Life Course Epidemiology of Adiposity and Diabetes Center here at CU Anschutz. Dr. Moore's research examines how early life exposure to environmental chemicals contribute to children's health with a focus on in utero exposure to secondhand smoke with childhood growth and neurodevelopment. Dr. Moore's work has been funded through extramural grants, including her current research support through the R00 phase of the NIH Career Development Award. So today, Dr. Moore will be sharing some of this research in her talk titled Tobacco Exposure and Children's Health, Identifying Critical Windows and Joint Effects. Before I pass it over to Dr. Moore, I'd like to remind everyone to keep themselves on mute and to please hold your questions until the end of the talk. We have about 10 to 15 minutes set aside for Q&A. So Dr. Moore, whenever you are ready, I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Wei, and thank you all for being here. I'm very excited to be talking today. Um, my seminar, as, as Wei said, will be discussing tobacco exposure and childhood health. I'll be looking at critical windows and joint effects. Oh, oh no. Okay, there we go. So Wei gave me such a great introduction, but just to reiterate, um, I did get my PhD at CSU. I did some my postdoctoral training at CU Anschutz. And as she said, being January of last year, I have been an assistant professor of epidemiology at the UT uh, Health Science Center in Houston, but, but actually I'm in Austin. Uh, my research looks at environment, early life exposures and how that influences childhood growth and neurodevelopment. And a particular focus has really been tobacco, but I also have looked at, uh, or I'm going to be looking at cannabis. I've looked at air pollution and nutrition as well. So to give an outline of my talk, I'll be talking about tobacco exposure and childhood obesity first. Then I'll be talking about tobacco exposure and childhood neurocognitive development. I'll then talk about some future directions for my research, some ongoing projects I'm working on, and then I'll talk about implications of my research and some long-term goals. So first, First, to get started, I'll be talking about tobacco exposure and childhood obesity. I wanted to start with kind of an interesting fact about tobacco that people may not know. Tobacco is a member of the nightshade family. Uh, as you can see from this photo, other nightshades include tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, and eggplants. Incidentally, these uh, vegetables also have nicotine in them, just like tobacco, but they're in much lower quantities. So you're gonna find about 4,000 times as much nic uh, nicotine in a cigarette as you would in a medium potato. But I do think that's kind of an interesting little fact and uh, something to think about. A little bit more background about tobacco use uh, among women in the United States anyway. In the 1920s, women, in, women were first marketed to pretty heavily by tobacco companies. You can see here an early ad for mild as may cigarettes this, um, it took a little bit longer for women to pick up on smoking. So prevalence peaked a little bit later than it did with men in the United States, where in 1965, the prevalence peaked at about 34%. We don't have as much data about historical prevalence of tobacco use in pregnancy, but as of 2016, there's still about 7% of women who report smoking during pregnancy. So a lot of progress has been made, but there's still some concern here that about 7% of women are active smokers. And in addition to that, there's still about 25% of women who are exposed to secondhand smoke, even if they weren't smokers themselves. So about 30% of, or about a third of women are still experiencing this exposure. So the concern here is that maternal smoking during pregnancy is related to many outcomes for the offspring. Most notably is that smoking has been consistently sure. linked to low birth weight since the 1970s. Uh, paradoxically, and, and very interesting is that smoking in pregnancy is then associated with rapid catch-up growth in the first year of life, and then obesity later in childhood. 
The mechanisms for this are pretty well established, but there's still some uncovering that needs to be done here. But I would say one of the most well-known mechanisms here is fetal hypoxia. Nicotine is a vasoconstrictor, so it limits the uh, nutrients and oxygen supply to the fetus. And this can lead to uh, intrauterine growth restriction. There is also the potential for epigenetic modifications in utero, but also if epigenetic inheritance if the exposure occurs prior to pregnancy in the preconception period. And both of these would contribute to low birth weight. And as I mentioned, this rapid catch-up uh, growth in early infancy, followed by obesity in childhood. And here, this figure really illustrates this. I'll be showing a lot of these growth trajectories throughout, but this is a, a growth trajectory where on the x-axis, you can see their age in months. And on the y-axis, you can see their body mass index. And the dark line indicates offspring that were exposed to active smoking during pregnancy and the blue dotted line shows offspring that had no exposure during pregnancy. And you can see that even though they started at a lower uh, body mass index at birth, that they quickly caught up at about a year and then they exceeded that growth trajectory uh, to where they, that would put them on the path for a higher risk for obesity later in childhood. Additionally, postnatal exposure to tobacco uh, smoke is also associated with these outcomes, but it's not quite as well established. Um, the mechanism for this is that postnatal exposure to tobacco can induce inflammation and oxidative stress in the child. And this has been shown to increase the risk for obesity in children by at least 30%. Um, this is, again, a growing amount of evidence is showing this. And it's possible that I'll talk more about this later, but it's, it's difficult to tease out prenatal versus postnatal exposure. So the gaps in the literature here, one of the main gaps here is the critical windows of exposure still need to be identified. Very few studies have looked at both prenatal and postnatal exposures within the same study. As I mentioned, uh, mothers may use in pregnancy and continue using the postnatal period. So it's actually really hard to differentiate and uh, distinguish these the effects of prenatal and postnatal exposures. Therefore, the most susceptible developmental periods are unknown. So there's really a need here to apply a life course approach to look at uh, exposures throughout and which ones may be uh, the most important windows of exposure. Another important gap in literature is the potential for joint effects. So there's some exposures that may increase the risk and some exposures that may actually decrease the risk of this exposure. So an ex one example would be concurrent exposure to ambient air pollution. This may actually augment the risk of secondhand smoke because there's a lot of similar mechanisms here related to uh, offspring growth and uh, obesity. So some of those mechanisms may include inflammation and oxidative stress, which are really well established, but then there's also the potential mechanism of altering the metabolic profile of adipose tissue in utero as well. On the other hand, early life nutrition may actually minimize the effects of secondhand smoke. A great example of this would be breast milk. We know that breast milk has many uh, benefits to it, immune factors that it provides to the infant include and additionally, it includes anti-inflammatory and antioxidant protection. So next, I'll be talking about the cohort that I've been using for this, which is the Healthy Start study. This cohort, which many of you may be familiar with, is led by Dr. Donna Velia. This is a uh, cohort of 1,400, about 1,400 ethnically diverse mother-child pairs in Colorado. The, there's many benefits of this cohort, but for the purposes of my research, one of the benefits is that there is a tremendous amount of, of data on secondhand smoke exposures throughout the duration of the study. So women were recruited at 17 weeks pregnant and uh, were asked about their exposures before pregnancy and the children have been followed through five years of age and beyond, but for today I'll be focusing on this window of time. As I mentioned, uh, we have a lot of data here on uh, measures of secondhand smoke. Uh, one benefit is that we have uh, biomarkers of exposure. So cotinine is the major metabolite of nicotine. And this was measured in urine samples collected at 27 weeks gestation, as well as five years of age in the child. Additionally, we, ha we have self-report of exposure to secondhand smoke at all of these time periods. And again, at 17 weeks, we asked uh, 
the mothers about their uh, use before pregnancy. Right now, I want to give a very quick caveat about cotinine. Uh, cotinine is a metabolite of nicotine, which means that it's not necessarily specific to traditional uh, cigarettes. So there's a need actually to determine whether cotinine and NAL, which is another tobacco specific biomarker uh, or other biomarkers can differentiate between e-cigarettes, traditional cigarettes, nicotine replacement therapy, etc. So this is a little bit of a limitation, but I will say that through the ECHO uh, consortium, the environmental influences on childhood health outcomes, which many of you again might be familiar with, there's a, a group that out of Minnesota that is actually working to determine whether some or a combination of these biomarkers can help to differentiate between these exposures. But moving forward, I just wanted to acknowledge that that is a limitation of using this biomarker is that it can't actually tell you if it was specifically traditional cigarettes or other sources of nicotine, including food. So oh, what I've, I wanna talk now about my first paper, which is looking at these critical windows of exposure. The research question here is, does the association between exposure to tobacco on childhood adiposity depend on the timing of the exposure? The way that we looked at, uh, at the outcome here, was ne which was neonatal and childhood adiposity, was using air displacement plasmography, um, also known as the P-pod or BOD-pod. This is a non-invasive device that can actually get at adiposity directly by measuring fat mass and fat-free mass. And the way that adiposity is determined is by dividing the fat mass by the total mass to get their percent fat mass or adiposity. The analysis for this paper, for the outcomes I used adiposity at five years of age. And then I also looked at changes in adiposity from birth to five years of age. This also gave me the opportunity to implement a, a novel approach here by using the multiple informant model approach within a GEE model to estimate the associations between secondhand smoke and uh, obesity. And I was able, the, one really big benefit of this model is that it will formally test for whether these associations depend on timing. You add a product term between the exposure and the timing of the exposure, so when it occurred. And when you include this into the model, this will actually get at the interaction between the exposure and timing. And one little, uh, one little plug here for this method is that this can be applied to any exposure outcome relationship, and it is being increasingly used in the environmental research as people are becoming more um, interested in the idea of windows of susceptibility and when children may be most susceptible to certain environmental exposures. Our results, uh, which are shown here, the figure here shows the, on the x-axis are the time points. So we have everything from preconception all the way up through five years of age. And on the y-axis is the difference in adiposity between the exposed and non-exposed. So for each time point, this is really indicating the difference in uh, their percent fat mass if they were exposed versus non-exposed at that specific time point. So our results here indicated that children experienced increased adiposity at five years of age if the mother smoked during the preconception period or at five months of age. And I will say that this is quite interesting that none of the uh, in none of the prenatal exposures were shown to be significant here. And this is interesting because a lot of the research really focuses on the prenatal period. Um, so I found that this these results were quite interesting. The results also indicated that children experience increased adiposity accretion. So the difference between adiposity at five years versus at birth if the mother smoked preconception or um, through delivery. And I think the through delivery piece is, is either an indication of smoking throughout the entire course of pregnancy, or it could truly just be smoking late gestation, which would have um, a lot of impact. That's when the last month of pregnancy is when a lot of the fetus is putting on a lot of weight and fat mass. So that could be why that, that very late pregnancy showed up as a critical window here. And there was strong evidence that this association depended on the timing of exposure, meaning that the timing really does matter for uh, how it affects the offspring. So in conclusion, we found that fetal and childhood exposure to tobacco immediately before pregnancy through 
late gestation and in early child or in early infancy, excuse me, may have the greatest impact on childhood adiposity. Our results here really highlight some novel, they provide some novel insights about underlying mechanisms, the first of which could be epigenetic inheritance, again, for the preconception exposures or modifications. Um, there's also the potential for structural and functional changes to the placenta. This would really apply particularly for those exposures late in pregnancy, when again, the fetus is putting on a lot of weight. And then finally, postnatal physiological and be behavioral changes. This really could point to why early infancy was highlighted as a critical window and not later in childhood, because in early those early infants are have a much higher respiratory rate. So even if they're exposed to the same amount of smoke or really any other chemical, they're gonna have a higher relative dose compared to other um, older children. And the behavioral changes in this early infancy would be uh, the reliance on breast milk and then the introduction of foods and, and maybe that exposure becomes less important as the child is spending less time at home and things like that. These results also emphasize the need for smoking cessation efforts to be tailored and paid perhaps extended from preconception all the way through the early postpartum period when relapse is unfortunately very common. So that is that is uh, that part of the research. Next is um, joint effects with air pollution. There's an abundance of research that has shown that high levels of exposure to traffic related and ambient air pollution, such as PM 2.5 and ozone have been linked to low birth weight. In the Healthy Start study, there is actually limited evidence that ozone and PM 2.5 exposures in pregnancy were associated with birth weight or neonatal adiposity. This is actually inconsistent with previous studies, uh, which is quite interesting. There are some possibilities for this. Some of that might be that there are actually just lower concentrations of these exposures in the Denver Metro, or that there's just very low variability across the Denver Metro. Other possibilities might be that other factors may alter risk. So there could be, it could be that social factors could influence the relationship between ambient air pollution and uh, low birth weight, or it could be that perhaps tobacco, which I will talk about now, could alter risk here. So the research question I was interested in is, is the joint effect of fetal exposure to tobacco and ambient air pollution on childhood growth trajectories greater than would be expected due to the individual exposures alone? In other words, is there an interactive effect between exposure to tobacco and ambient air pollution that could affect childhood growth trajectories? The way that in Healthy Start, the way that ozone and PM 2.5 were assessed was by using uh, stationary monitors. So here is a map that indicates where all the participants were, those indicated by the black dots. The green dots, uh, the green squares indicate where the ozone, the stationary EPA ozone monitors were located, and the yellow triangles indicate where the PM 2.5 mon monitors were located. And this was used to estimate exposures via inverse distance weighted interpolation. So there are some limitations here. This is a great, this is a very large area and not that many monitors, but um, this is a quite com common approach to estimate exposures to ozone and PM 2.5. These estimates were used to determine pregnancies throughout the entire pregnancy period, as well as trimester specific windows. And we categorized exposures based on the median as either high exposure or low exposure. The methods for this were pretty straightforward. We used linear regression models for the outcome of neonatal adiposity. We use mixed effects linear models for the outcomes of BMI growth trajectories, which again, you've seen a little bit before. And we assess the interaction by including a product term between cotinine and the air pollution categories into our models to assess whether, again, the effect would be greater than expected than due to the individual exposures alone. So our results here indicated that offsprings offspring of mothers with high exposure to PM 2.5 during the third trimester only experienced no difference in birth weight. However, they had more rapid BMI growth than compared to uh, those with no exposure. So again, here's another growth trajectory. On the x-axis, we have age and months. On the y-axis is the body mass index. You can see that uh, the dark line is children who had both exposures and the other lines indicate other exposures. And you can see that even though they started at about the same body mass index, 
that those with both exposures had a much more rapid growth trajectory there. These results are quite interesting given that P2.5 is generally within the good EPA air quality standards. On the, on the right here, we have the air quality index as provided by the EPA, and you can see the range of P2.5 levels. And Colorado, or Dem the Denver Metro was generally within this green good uh, level, which is great. Um, we still found, however, that higher exposure during the third trimester led to rapid BMI growth when com with combined with maternal smoking. And again, this could be because there are some similar mechanisms such as inflammation, oxidative stress, altering the metabolic profile. And these results really point to the fact that obesity prevention strategies may need to actually target both exposures to achieve the maximum public health benefit. Um, this is specific to obesity, but if other studies indicated an interactive effect with air pollution and smoking, which is a uh, potentially indoor air, air pollutant exposure, that, that could also benefit it could also achieve the maximum public health benefit. Another joint effect I've looked at is the impact of tobacco exposure and breastfeeding on infant adiposity. So breastfeeding, as we know, provides infants with uh, a lot of benefits, including anti-inflammatory and antioxidant protection. However, when it comes to smoking, if the mother is a smoker or perhaps exposed uh, very heavily to secondhand smoke, there could be an additional lactational exposure to nicotine and other chemicals. So it's possible that smoking, that breastfeeding, uh, a smoker who breastfeeds may um, also be exposing her child to a, a more, a even higher dose uh, given lactational exposure. So my research question here was, does the association between postnatal exposure to secondhand smoke on infant adiposity depend on the duration of exclusive breast, breastfeeding? At the five month visit, women were asked to report their infant feeding practices. Very few women indicated that they had exclusively formula fed from, from birth. Most indicated some sort of mixed formula feeding, meaning that they had attempted or initiated breastfeeding at any point. And about 45% had indicated that they had exclusively breastfed through that five month visit. Women also self-reported household smokers at the time at the five month visit. And again, infant adiposity was measured via the pod, pod, pee pod device. The association between, our results indicated that the association between secondhand smoke and infant adiposity differed by their infant feeding practices. So among infants who were not breastfed, smoke, secondhand smoke was associated with a one kilogram or a little over two pound increase in fat mass, whereas there was no difference in adiposity among those who were breastfed. This really points to breastfeeding being both a critical window, which would tie in with my previous research, and also an opportunity for intervention. So smoking relapse, unfortunately, is common during the early, early postpartum period, even among women who successfully quit smoking during pregnancy. Fortunately, research has indicated that breastfeeding initi initiation may be a key strategy for preventing relapse. And research also indicates that longer duration of breastfeeding may be associated with a, redu a further reduced risk of relapse. So this really, again, points to this early infancy as um, another potential window to jump in and to help with smoking cessation efforts for uh, the benefit of the mother as well as the child. Next, I'm gonna transition into another piece of my research which looks at tobacco exposure and childhood neurocognitive development. So tobacco is toxic to the fetal brain. Uh, nicotine induced fetal hypoxia may lead directly to a decreased brain volume. There's also a mechanism here where fetal exposure to tobacco may overstimulate nicotonic acetylcholine receptors. These are found all over the brain, but they're also very concentrated in the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory and learning, as well as the, as well as the cerebellum, which is responsible for motor control. And so overstimulating these can alter the, the ability of these regions of the brain's function, uh, which can lead to neurocognitive developmental delays. Another potential mechanism here, and I'll link with low birth weight, that's kind of interesting, is that nicotine exposure during pregnancy is associated with a loss of gray or and or white brain matter, uh, which could then lead to impaired 
fine motor skills, as well as other neurocognitive outcomes. But what's interesting here is that low birth weight or uh, smaller head circumference could be a proxy, meaning that it could be along the causal pathway here and a potential mechanism for these neurocognitive outcomes. So the research question here is, does fetal exposure to tobacco impact childhood neurocognitive development independent of low birth weight, which again could be a mediator, or uh, preterm delivery? For this study, we explored the association between fetal exposure to active and secondhand maternal smoking with developmental milestones. This was assessed through the ages and stages questionnaire, uh, which is very commonly administered in well child visits. Uh, as well as cognitive outcomes, which is measured using the NIH toolbox, which is a, a novel uh, way to assess cognitive skills. This measured cognitive skills such as inhibitory control, which is the ability to ignore irrelevant stimuli. We restricted our analyses, as I mentioned, to those born at 37 weeks or later, which is considered full term. Uh, we also restricted our analyses to those born greater than 2,500 grams, which is uh, considered low birth weight. The reason we did this is because these actually might be potential mediators or along the causal pathway and adjusting for these potential mediators could actually bias our results. So we wanted to really focus on whether these this association persists among those who were full term and born at a healthy at a not low birth weight. Our, um, the results here indicated that offspring with fetal exposure to tobacco experience delayed fine motor development skills as well as reduced inhibitory control. And both of these are important because fine motor development is really a good indicator of childhood readiness for reading and writing. Um, fine motor development at this age is really being able to use scissors, draw, color, and all of these skills are pretty essential by the time a child enters kindergarten. And it is very well correlated with academic performance later in life. So these early fine motor development skills are very important. Uh, inhibitory control is also important because this is, again, the ability to ignore irrele irrelevant stimuli. Um, so it also helps to predict some academic performance, but also just later uh, higher, uh, higher order uh, critical thinking skills. The next steps for this of the next steps for this branch of my research, uh, which are going to be led by a a wonderful PhD student of mine is to look at the impact of tobacco use in pregnancy on childhood behavior. We'll also be looking at the critical windows of exposure. So similar to what I did with obesity as the outcome, we'll be doing that with these neurocognitive outcomes. And then she will also be looking at joint effects with nutrition. So real big focus here, we'll be looking at maternal intakes of folate. Uh, folate on its own is associated with improved uh, neuro neurocognitive outcomes. And so we'll be looking at whether uh, maternal intakes of folate minimize the association between uh, uh, secondhand smoke and these neurocognitive outcomes. Next, I'll be talking about some of the future directions from my research. So something that is closely related to tobacco exposure potentially is uh, cannabis use during pregnancy and neuro child childhood growth and neurodevelopment. So we know that uh, cannabis use among pregnant women is uh, potentially an, a growing concern. Here you can see a, a figure. This was using data from the PRAN study. This is self-reported cannabis use during pregnancy over the last month. So beginning in 2014 through 2019, some states have been able to track, it, to ask women to self-report their uh, use of cannabis in pregnancy. And you can see that in certain states, it seems like there is definitely an upward trend. And this is uh, concerning given that we really don't know the effects of cannabis use in pregnancy on uh, the offspring. Uh, many people may know this, but cannabis use has been linked to impaired neurodevelopment in the outcome. It's also been linked to low birth weight. This is, it's interesting because the effects may actually be stronger than what has previously been reported because THC potency is now six to seven times higher than it was in the 1970s. So any results that we do have indicating a link could actually be higher given that, again, uh, women and their fetuses are potentially getting a much higher dose of THC. What's also really interesting to note is that THC and CBD have opposing effects on the brain. So CBD is 
actually has some neuroprotective properties, but it's just not clear whether um, it is a, a negative, whether it has these properties for the offspring. So the gaps in literature here really are, does exposure to cannabis in pregnancy contribute to low birth weight and rapid catch-up growth, kind of similar to the same growth pattern as uh, tobacco exposure? Another gap in the literature is whether exposure to cannabis in pregnancy is, can contribute to impaired cognitive function or behavior problems. And then finally, something I'm really interested in is whether uh, cannabinoids have opposing effects on the offspring. So I have some ongoing research right now. Uh, I have had THC, CBD, and nine other cannabinoids being measured in stored urine and umbilical cord tissue samples in the Healthy Start cohort. The benefit of looking at it in the umbilical cord tissue is that it actually measures, it actually captures exposure over the last two trimesters, whereas urine um, is just going to tell you very recent exposure. So it's possible that combining these, we could get a better idea of their exposure over the entire pregnancy period. Uh, this study will be among the first to try to disentangle the effects of THC and CBD during pregnancy on offspring growth and neurodevelopment. And it's really hoped here that this could set up, this could be used as preliminary data for some future NIDA grants. The first would be a grant looking at genetics or epigenetics of substance use disorders. This could actually also apply to tobacco use in either the, the mother or the offspring. Another potential NIDA mechanism is the effects of cannabis use and cannabinoids on the developing brain. Um, that would also really fit in very nicely with this research. And I'm hoping that um, I could get some preliminary data together for that. All right, lastly, I wanna kind of wrap up here on implications of my research and some future directions. So the inter uh, one big implication here is, is the idea of when to intervene um, with smoking cessation. Smoking cessation campaigns, based on my research, they may need to be expanded to include all critical windows. So if we're wanting to really prevent these effects on the offspring, preconception may actually be the ideal time. Unfortunately, it is really difficult to reach this population given that um, they're not actually going usually to the doctor very often, um, and it may just be hard to identify this population in general. During pregnancy though, women may be more motivated to change their behavior. Fortunately, during pregnancy, a lot of women do make positive health changes. And as I mentioned, a lot of women do quit smoking during pregnancy. However, in postpartum, a lot of these women do uh, unfortunately relapse, but there is an opportunity here to reach these women through well child visits. Um, they're bringing their children in pretty regularly for visits with their physician, and this may be a great opportunity for interventions. And as I mentioned, uh, postpartum is also potentially a great opportunity to intervene given that uh, women are breastfeeding and this might also be have the, the extra benefit of uh, educating them further on this. Finally, another implication here is just the need possibly for uh, in expanded policies, including pregnancy warning signs. So there is a need perhaps for a, a national or statewide requirement that pregnancy warning signs to be displayed in dispensaries. In the state of Washington, this is the sign that they are required to post um, indicating that cannabis use during pregnancy may have uh, effects on the offspring. Colorado has a similar, um, a, a similar policy. However, you can see this is the sign and um, it's quite small and not as not quite as clear that pregnant women and breastfeeding women should probably perhaps plan to abstain. So there's still some room here to grow, um, both in terms of intervention and policy, um, to really build on this research. And finally, I just want to acknowledge my collaborators that I've uh, developed my collaborations I've made at the University of Colorado, Colorado State, and uh, UT Health. And that is the end of my talk. Wrapping up a little early. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. Thank you. Um, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. So um, would anyone like to start us off? While folks are thinking, I, I'll start with a question. So um, you mentioned in your talk today, as well as um, the last time we talked, of your interest in intervention work. And I think that is a goal for many of us epidemiologists who do observational studies. 
Um, and I'm curious if you thought about how you're going to um, kind of step into the area of intervention, what kinds of populations you might leverage given the resources available to you at CU Landships? That's a really great question. I think because I focused for so long on um, early childhood and pregnancy, my instinct would be to start in pregnancy. But again, my research is kind of showing that maybe pregnancy is too late. And so I think ideally, um, I've said this before a couple of times today, but we know that 95% of smokers start before they're 21. So really, if we could prevent smokers from starting at that early age, I think that would really prevent a lot of these issues. So I'm kind of stuck between a very wide range of either start very early and just preventing smoking at all, or really trying to intervene um, pregnancy and again, extending that maybe through the postpartum period. So I think either one, I think maybe it's possible that both would be effective. Um, but if I wanna stay within the pregnancy, I would probably focus on mid-pregnancy through postpartum. I think ideally you would start way before that to even prevent the smoking being an issue in pregnancy. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, while you were talking, I was reminded of um, something I heard from someone. And I don't know how true this is because tobacco <laughs> and cannabis use is not my real house. But I have heard that um, use of marijuana is the gateway to other other sorts of activities like smoking. And I, I don't know if that's actually true, but if so, um, do you think you would somehow incorporate um, your more recent interest in cannabis use into this prevention paradigm? Yeah, I think uh, that's a really great question. I'm not sure myself either. I know that <laughs> e-cigarettes are also hypothesized as a, as a gateway for traditional cigarette use. I think they all kind of relate to one another. So I think that actually would be I mean, I think ideally a lot of us epidemiologists are interested in this like holistic health intervention. So not just focusing on one particular behavior, but focusing on it all. So I think that's really why I've been so interested in breastfeeding and tobacco is because they can really play off of each other nicely. <clears throat> Excuse me. If I may continue with, with a question to Brianna and great to see you again, Brianna. <clears throat> You mentioned um, in in some somewhere in your presentation um, um, the Echo Consortium, and I'm just curious. Uh, you've been part of indirectly of the Echo Consortium when you were here and working with with us, um, so you know uh, a little bit or more about it. But I'm just curious, how would you leverage? your um, affiliation, eventual affiliation with, with such a large consortium focused on enver environmental exposures and their effect on children's health um, as part of your future research plans? That's a great question. Uh, am I muted? No, I'm not. Uh, I have, uh, yes, like you said, I've been working indirectly with the ECHO Consortium. I think one great or one exciting avenue is being able to look at e-cigarette versus traditional cigarettes, because again, I don't think there's a lot of research on that. I think there's a lot of confusion about whether e-cigarettes are better or worse on the offspring or just in general. Uh, so I think that's one avenue that I'm starting to explore. I think there's a lot of potential to look at cannabis, uh, especially if, again, for some of these effects that maybe are smaller, um, or harder to capture, meaning, you know, cannabis may not be experienced by that many people. So looking at it in the ECHO Consortium would actually be really beneficial. And I have seen a little, a small murmuring of people interested in looking at cannabis use. So once I get my data together, hopefully I can jump in and, and start working with some other collaborators on that, because I think it's really understudied, uh, given just how little we've been able to study it over the years. Um, and then, like I said, e-cigarettes as well, pretty new um, emerging problem, and we just don't have a whole lot of data, and Echo Consortium would probably be great for that. I, I saw that Lisa Miller had her hand up, so Lisa, would you like to ask a question? Lisa, I am having trouble hearing you. I don't know if others are. Yeah, you're on mute. I'm just, my microphone wasn't down. Is that better? Yes. Okay, got my microphone on. Um, so I'm wondering how you think about social determinants of health in your research. 
So especially when you were talking about, um, say, PM 2.5, and we think about environmental justice and mm -hmm. where high levels of PM 2.5 are found and all the other uh, determinants of health that go along with being in those areas, um, housing and education. And how do you how do you think about the impact of of those other factors and, and take that into account? That's an excellent question. And, you know, with, with smoking, that's always been the challenge is that we know there's such a strong link with smoking exposure and um, lower education and, and a lot of these other social factors like you were discussing. I think one thing I always think about is that a lot of animal models have been shown to find these effects and they are not restricted to the same you know, social factors that we are. So on the one hand, if you just look at the animal models, it kind of takes that social aspect off the table. But I realized that in the, in, in epidemiologic research that that is a really big concern. I always adjust for those, but I have to acknowledge that at the end of the day, some of that really might be driving some of the associations I'm finding. So I think that really, if anything, points even more to the fact of the importance of interventions and just preventing these exposures in the first place, uh, especially if it is clustered together with these other social factors. I, again, I think that's really important. And like I said, I always adjust for it, but I, I recognize that that's not, <laughs> that's not nearly sufficient enough to address the social factors, like you said. So great question. Hi, Brianna. Thank you for a, a really interesting presentation. I, uh... In a way, this is like a little bit of follow up of question um, from what you uh, had just mentioned in terms of your response to Lisa. Um, you mentioned in your end of your talk that perhaps having to prevent the starting of smoking, um, you know, before it starts, right? Just, just, mm -hmm. just prevent it, um, in which means going to people under the age of 18, et cetera. Um, can, do you know, are there efforts um, with that goal in mind in, in that population and, and um, what, what do they look like? Um, and it's sort of related a little bit perhaps to Lisa's question too, because how do you do an intervention such as this when people are coming from so many different um, aspects? But first of all, my question is, is I'm curious as to what, what are there, are there prevention efforts out there to prevent smoking? I mean, in, in adolescence. That's a great question. I know that um, our group in Texas actually has an e-cigarette prevention program and it's school-based. So that is an ongoing um, and I don't, they don't have the results for that yet, but they're just rolling that out and they're actually starting in middle school. Um, mm -hmm. They're not necessarily looking at, they're not educating to help with pregnancy. <laughs> so that's not really an explicit goal of that. Um, and again, I don't know what the success rate is, is going to be of that, but I think a lot of the interventions, at least in adolescents, tend to be school-based. And so it's, it's not clear to me anyway. Again, that's not really my expertise at this point. It's something I'd like to get further into, but it's not clear whether um, how, how effective that is and how long-lasting that prevention uh, efforts will last. But I think, uh, I think those are some interesting ideas is to make it school-based, so there is some, some intervention work already being done. So I'm definitely not trying to, uh, do, to recreate something that is already going really well, but I think maybe we could add to it or build on that or uh, maybe make it a little bit more focused on certain populations, perhaps not super clear on that yet. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm waiting to see if there is somebody else wanting to say something because I uh, the the conversation with, with Lisa and Jill's questions made me uh, think of another comment, potential question or suggestion for you, uh, Rihanna. I, I I think our group is very actively focusing on a preconceptional period uh, in in some of our efforts uh, as perhaps being an even better a window of opportunity to 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 prevent many um, uh, long term effects uh, uh, on the offspring of, of exposures happening in preconception and, and throughout pregnancy. And we're, we're targeting um, this preconceptual period with uh, thinking about behavioral interventions, 
especially in in uh, women from disadvantaged backgrounds and probably perhaps a more holistic way um, to intervene is the way to go. In addition to what we are planning, we might include components related to substance use um, and, and accomplish that, that more complex, more holistic intervention that you were talking about. And, and such efforts exist in our group. Are, I'm going and uh, there's room to improve uh, <laughs> the interventions that we're thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, I'm thinking about this as in terms of, yes, ideally we would start in adolescence, perhaps maybe, maybe adolescents aren't as motivated. <laughs> I mean, again, talking to them about if a reason to not smoke in pregnant or to not smoke in adolescence is because it could affect their uh, later children, it just doesn't, it might not connect. Whereas the preconception period, they might be a little bit more motivated to change. So yeah, it, it's really not clear which, which is the best time to intervene, but that sounds great. Yeah. Preconception does seem like a great opportunity. And I was pretty surprised by that result myself in my own research, but I found it a lot in the literature as well. So it really does appear to be an important window. I guess one, one thing to keep in mind that I don't think I heard you talk about is the rate of unintended pregnancies, especially among young people. And, I, and although we've made great strides in Colorado, you know, I think that rate in other places is still yeah. amazingly high. So the fact that many, many pregnancies are unintended makes that preconception yeah. intervention a little challenging. And I don't know if you've thought about that. No, that's great. I think that's a really great point. And that is really, and uh, that's why it was so surprising to me because I think, I think a lot of research has focused on pregnancy because it's a very specific time <laughs> and it's a very specific window. So I think that's really why a lot of people have focused on that. The preconception window, like you said, is a lot harder to, to nail down. Also how far preconception, are we talking three months, a year? Um, again, if it's a decade, then we could really be talking about adolescence. So <laughs> yeah. So that's a really great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Hi, I had a question, um, and this is me just sort of thinking out loud, but I know in Healthy Start and in the ECHO Consortium, we look at a lot of different exposures related to these outcomes. Can you just put in context for me, like for my own knowledge, where smoking would fall in terms of biggest bang for your buck, so to speak. Um, it, you know, uh, it, it seems like intervention in the preconception period is difficult, probably going to be costly. Um, you know, how, do you think it would be potentially more advantageous to focus um, on smoking or on different types of exposures or behaviors? That's a Really great question. And I think, I guess you're asking like, how does it uh, affect the offspring to other potential? I guess exposures? so, yeah. I think that there is quite a lot of, of strong literature, pretty consistent linking it with some of these outcomes. I don't know how much it, you know, that's a challenge. It's hard to know whether uh, nutrition matters more, uh, especially, you know, when you're talking about childhood nutrition, does that affect the child more than smoking? Smoking, I think, unfortunately, does kind of end up becoming a catch-all for some of these social factors, which we talked about earlier. So there's that too. Um, but it is pretty, it's a pretty strong signal. So I think it is worth focusing on because it is kind of a specific exposure and a specific population that can be targeted. It's To me, it's kind of equivalent. I'm thinking, I'm kind of talking out loud here, but it's kind of equivalent to the focus in pregnancy on gestational weight gain. It's something that can be easily measured and easily tracked, whereas it's much harder to track and measure uh, the maternal nutrition, right? And it's, it's harder. So there tends to be a lot of focus on that gestational weight gain and a lot of emphasis on it, whereas maybe nutrition matters more, but we, we just have a much more clear uh, way to measure that. So I think that's why smoking ends up becoming, it's measured so much is because it's just, like I said, a very specific exposure, a very specific population, and it's relatively easy to measure. So I don't know. I don't know that it's necessarily more important than the others, but it just is measured a lot. <laughs> I, mean, I, I would volunteer that it is okay. extremely important. Um, there's a, in my maternal child health epi class, we look at the population 
attributable risk for different uh, exposures during the perinatal period. And smoking is the single most um, modif the modifiable factor that's associated with the most infant morbidity and mortality in the United States. Just to follow up on Tessa's comment, I was gonna also open my mouth to say attributable risk. Um, 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 I'm advocating in ECHO for this um, comprehensive paper that would look at population attributable risks for childhood obesity and partition that across a variety of exposures. We don't have those um, metrics yet. What proportion of childhood obesity is it due to diet, is, is due to physical activity, to maternal conditions, to maternal behaviors, things like that. I think ECHO can do that and we just need a champion <laughs> to write the paper. <laughs> That's great. That would actually be really useful, I feel like. have about seven minutes left. Are there any additional questions for Dr. Moore? Yeah, actually, you know, I, I'd like to ask Brianna, if you were to, to come to uh, back <laughs> to the University of Colorado, uh, Anschutz Medical Campus and Lead Center, what would be your immediate um, research and, and teaching career goals? Or what are you planning to do? Yeah. That's a great question. I love that question. I really um, been working on the cannabis research for a very long time, getting that set up. Um, had a tremendous amount of delays for from COVID. So, like I said, any day now I should be getting that data, and I'd really like to to use that as preliminary data and kind of get um, a grant out pretty quickly with that because I just think that's pretty. Um, you know, I know it's a I know it's a hot topic right now, but I also think it really is there's a big need to, to study that pretty immediately, given that we just really don't know. And um, it bothers me every day that we go by and really don't know the effects on the offspring. So I really focus on that. And I think the second thing, which I mentioned was looking at epigenetics of uh, substance use and that could apply to tobacco or cannabis. So I think those are the two really short-term research goals that I have. Long-term I'm thinking intervention, but I think in the, in the short term, I'd really like to just focus on the effects of cannabis and. Uh, and then again, tobacco or cannabis use. And then teaching wise, I uh, here I'm gonna be teaching an environmental epidemiology class in the fall, which I'm very excited about. But my two other real passions for teaching are just general epidemiology and grant writing, which I've uh, co-taught in the past, but I really enjoy grant writing, even though I'm pretty junior, I just really enjoy it a lot. And I would really enjoy doing that class. So those would be kind of my teaching goals there. Thank you. Thank you for the question. <laughs> so I'll ask a question. Um, if you were to come back here, as Donna were asking, what do you think you could bring with you from what you're currently doing at your current institution? That's a great question. I think I've gained um, a real research engine. I haven't talked about this much because it's still pretty new and in, in my mind and everything, but I really gained a, a tremendous concern, I would say, an interest in water, uh, potential exposures in water. So that's something I'd like to develop further. And I've started to explore that here. Um, and I know the water, uh, the exposures in water are going to be different from state to state, but I do think that, you know, there is some, some growing concern about some of these water quality issues that I think I would like to explore further. And that's something that really, an interest of mine that grew out of living here and just kind of having different <laughs> exposures to things in, in Texas. So. That's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. I can talk about that some other time too, but <laughs> like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a new emerging of mine. Um, yeah. Well, um, Brianna, thank you very much for taking the time to share your work with us. Um, as I'm sure you know, CU has, has had, has the edge in, um, you know, cannabis and to some extent tobacco research. So it seems like there's um, 
good overlap between your agenda and ongoing work here as well, whether that be through Healthy Start or Echo or mm -hmm. the specific focus on tobacco and cannabis. So it was yeah. really nice to hear about your work and maybe we can end with a round of virtual applause <laughs> for Dr. Moore. <laughs> Thank you.